So uh, I'll try to give you a bit of an intro to this uh, digested data exchange concept, which is, um, I guess it was first introduced in 239 as a, just a backend service in DHS2, aggregate data exchange. Uh, and um, we now also have a front end app for previewing and uh, configuring these data exchanges. So I'll start with just a bit of an intro to what this aggregate data exchange is, how it works, um, how you configure it, and then I'll do a, uh, I'll do a demo uh, as well. And I think I shared with Shurajit a um, copy of um, Let me see. database where some of this is set up. So hopefully you can also try it out yourself later. Okay, so what is this aggregate data exchange thing? Um, it actually re refers to like a set of functionality in DHIS2 uh, to transfer aggregate data between a source and a target DHIS2 instance. Um, so you have one instance of DHIS2 where you are reading aggregate data from and one instance that you're saving this aggregate data into. Uh, what you can do is to make the source and the target instance the same so that you're actually just moving uh, aggregate data from one place in DHS2 to, uh, to another place. Uh, and this aggregate data exchange is uh, basically two things. One is a backend service um, that you can trigger. So you set up a data exchange and you basically start it as a job in DHS2. There's also a data exchange app that you can use to preview these data exchanges, um, run them and configure them. Uh, the main use cases for this is uh, cases where you actually want to move data between DHS2 instances. So maybe you have one HMIS instance and a data warehouse instance. Um, or you have a tracker instance and an HMIS instance. But you can also use it for what we call tracker to aggregate. So basically saving counts from tracker programs as aggregate data values into a data set. And in addition to looking at these uh, data exchanges in the data exchange app, uh, you can also schedule them to run um, using the scheduler app. So I'll just go through bit more detail on uh, these various aspects first before going into the demo. Uh, and please just let me know if you have questions um, or if something is not clear. So just starting with how this stuff works. Uh, essentially, this the, the work that the data exchange service is doing is something you can in a way manually replicate yourself uh, just from the analytics API and the um, data values API. So what the data exchange service does is that it reads data from the analytics API. It transforms the data into uh, what we call a data value set, which is the format DHS uses for aggregate data. And it pushes that data into the uh, data value set API of the target instance. So it reads from the analytics API and it pushes to the um, aggregate data uh, import API endpoint. Uh, and what this does is that it allows you to use aggregate indicators, data elements, program indicators, uh, even reporting rates as the source data and transform all of it into uh, sort of a raw aggregate data value uh, set. So this is just by using the API, you can actually replicate all of this. There is a, in the analytics endpoint, there is this special option to get data value sets out. And that gives you a format that you can import into the uh, <coughs> aggregate data value importer. 
uh, so on the sort of source side, the request side, uh, you can have data elements, indicators, program indicators, reporting rates, and all of it is transformed into data elements on the output side. So that's essentially what the aggregate data exchange uh, does. So for this external data exchanges, as I said, you can set up this to run move data from one DHS2 instance to another. Um, and in those cases, you only need to set up the aggregate data exchange on the source instance. Uh, so on the target instance, the only thing you need is the a user account. You add that to the target instance, but there is no installation or configuration required on the, the target instance. Of course, there needs to be some alignment of the actual metadata here to make it work. So you need to have org units that have some code or ID uh, in common. You need to have data elements with the same ID or code, etc. But there is no installation or configuration required on the, the receiving instance apart from that. Uh, so there are quite a few different use cases for this. Uh, one is if you have your tracker data separately from your aggregate data, you can use this to move the move aggregate counts from tracker into uh, an HMIS instance. Uh, if you have like a main HMIS aggregate instance that is used for data collection and you want to push some of the data into a more public open uh, database, you can use that, uh, use this for that. Uh, another use case that is receiving quite a lot of attention uh, in many countries now is this reporting to global fund it could also be other like international agencies that have a dhs2 instance running so pushing some indicators from your national instance into some sort of global reporting database so we have a project with global fund for this um which is actually so global fund has been funding a lot of the work around this whole data exchange um uh, functionality I think one thing to keep in mind here, especially with this um, public, more public data warehouses, portals, and the global reporting, is that this data exchange also allows you to uh, aggregate data up. Uh, so it actually, it's a way of, um, in a way, anonymizing the data a bit. So you can say, okay, in our public data warehouse, we only want to have district level data. We don't want to let people drill down to the facility level, for example. Um, or you can say we have weekly data, but we only want to publish the monthly data. Because this data exchange is uh, pulling data from the analytics API, you can do all sorts of aggregation uh, and produce rural numbers out of it. So you could have a public data warehouse, which has only district level uh, quarterly data, even if your HMIS has facility level weekly data, for example. The other main use case is for these internal data exchanges. So just moving data within DHIS2. And the main use case for this is um, doing what we call tracker to aggregate. So saving the uh, counts from uh, tracker programs as aggregate data in a data set. And to do this, the what you need to do is to set up program indicators for defining what you actually want to count for defining the ag aggregations, and then setting up some sort of link identifier that links each of these program indicators to a data element and category option combination on the receiving side. Um, and for this, you typically need to set up a custom attribute that holds this identifier link between the program indicator and the data element. I'll show you how this works in the demo later, uh, more in detail. But essentially, you define your program indicators. In this example here, it's TB household contacts that have been screened under five years. So you have a program indicator for that with an expression and a filter. But as part of the program indicator, you also specify what data element on the aggregate side is this supposed to feed into and what category option combination. 
And then you need to make sure you have those that data element and the category option combination available um, in a data set on the receiving, on the target side. There are a couple of uh, limitations here that it's important to be aware of. Uh, one is that this, since it's using the program indicators, um, if your program indicators are uh, slow, typically if you have big database or uh, complicated indicator formula, especially if it's an enrollment indicator. Uh, if the program indicator is slow, this process of aggregating the data will also be slow. Uh, so this won't solve uh, issues with program indicators being slow necessarily, but it means that you only run these slow queries once and then all the end users can use the fast aggregate um, analytics to actually analyze the data. So it helps to have your data as aggregate data, but you still need to have program indicators that are fast enough to run uh, when you do this data exchange. The other limitation is that uh, when you're updating, um, aggregate numbers from previous periods. Um, there are some special cases where this uh, data exchange doesn't um, update the old values, specifically if you have a facility that has, has reported a number and then the tracker data is edited and fixed and it turns out there shouldn't be any number for that particular facility. The data exchange will not remove the old value so it only updates existing values if there is still a value in the updated data. So that's something uh, the developers are looking into uh, how to fix. It's typically not a huge problem in practice, but it means that there can be, um, you can't trust the data 100% when you're updating data for previous periods when you're doing tracker target. Okay, so this data exchange app um, is available in the App Hub. It's not, it's developed by the core team, but it's not um, bundled with DHIS2. Um, it's available from version 2.39 uh, and above. What this app does is it allows you to preview data for these data exchanges that have been configured uh, and submitting the data manually. So you see the screenshot on the left, you have the, a preview of the numbers and you have a submit button. Uh, and in the last one or two versions of this app, uh, you're also able to actually configure the data exchanges within the app. Before that, you had to do that um, manually using the API. Uh, so to set up these data exchange jobs, whether it's an external job between two instances or an internal job, uh, you need to define what is called aggregate data exchanges, which is a, an object type in DHS2. So you can access this with the API, you can import it, you can export it, etc. Now that the data exchange app has functionality to configure these data exchanges, uh, that's by far the easiest way to do it. Um, so I recommend doing that. Um, but you can also define uh, a JSON file and import that if you prefer. The only limitation at the moment with this data exchange app is that it doesn't support uh, applying sharing to the aggregate data exchanges. So that needs to be done separately, either using the sharing API or by exporting the configuration, editing the JSON file and re-importing. So the sharing is coming, but it's not there in the current version. These actual aggregate data exchanges, they have basically three main components. Uh, I'll just show you here. Hopefully you're able to see, even though it's a bit small, but uh, it has the typical properties like a name and an ID. And then you define what is the source, so the source instance, where you can have one or more requests for data. 
And if you've looked at how the data visualizer favorites are defined, it's very similar. So you define uh, what data elements should be included, what periods, and what org units. Uh, and, it, and you specify some uh, ID schemes. I'll come back to those in a minute. Um, so that this defines what data is being extracted from the source instance. And then you define the targets. In this case, uh, it's an external exchange. You specify the, the URL and the username. Or typically, you would use the personal access token here and not username and password. I'll, I'll come back to that in the demo. And then you specify how this data should be imported, what ID schemes uh, to be used on the target side. So these identifier schemes are important when we're looking at these data exchange jobs. Um, because this, these identifier schemes are needed um, to map between metadata objects. So if you have two instances with the exact same metadata, and you're just moving from a data element on one side to a data element on the other side, uh, you don't really need to worry about the uh, ID schemas because then you would have organized state elements, everything will have the same UIDs. So if it's between two identical systems, you don't need to worry too much about this. But if you're doing some sort of transformation, maybe you're moving data from um, a program indicator to a data element, or you're moving um, data from an aggregate indicator into a data element, or you have slightly different org unit hierarchies, then you need to use these identifier schemes um, to define how to match the metadata. So you can say, okay, on the, on the source side, I need to use a custom attribute that includes a code that I will use to import the data element on the receiving side, for example. Um, so I'll show more how this works in the, in the demo, especially for if you use this as an internal job to do tracker to aggregate, uh, you really have to use uh, custom attributes and make use of uh, the custom attribute as your identifier. Uh, so these identifier schemes, you need to define both for each request on the source side and also on the target side. Um, so you see here on the, on the request side for the export, you have the general ID schema, which defines overall whether to use ID code or an attribute uh, for the data elements, category options, or units. Uh, but then you can also have different schemes specifically for data elements and or units. And it's the same thing for uh, on the import target side that you have one overall ID scheme that you can overwrite for specific uh, object types. When you're setting this up in the data exchange app, uh, you actually you don't specify you can't choose to just specify the general. You always need to um, have a, a value for all of these. But if you're setting it up. Uh, in a JSON file and importing, you, you could choose to only have one general. So that's why I say it overrides. If you have both a general and a specific, it's the specific ID scheme that is used, for example, for a data element. So if you put output general ID scheme as code and you put output data element scheme as ID, the data elements will have ID and everything else will use uh, codes. So if you're setting this up, uh, I think in most cases, um, you might want to set this up as a automated job that runs like every night or every week or something like that. Uh, and to enable that, exchange aggregate data is actually a job type that you can use the scheduler app to um, run automatically. Uh, but since this, Aggregate data exchange is actually reading data from analytics and then producing uh, raw data on the target system. Uh, 
it's important to keep in mind that this needs to be linked to the analytics jobs. So before you run the exchange job, job you should update analytics on the source instance. Otherwise, the exchange job doesn't have the latest uh, latest data available. And similarly, after the exchange job, um, you need to update uh, analytics on the target system before anyone can see the data that has been moved from the source to the target. Uh, specif specifically, if you're using the data exchange for tracker to aggregate, you need to run tracker analytics before the job and aggregate analytics after if you want people to be able to see your tracker data in an aggregate uh, report. So this means you need to have like a, a sequence of jobs running. Um, and from version 40, I, I didn't have time to double check, maybe even 39. Um, there is functionality to set up what is called queues in the scheduler app, where you set up several jobs to run uh, consecutively. So you make sure that one finishes before the next start. Before we had these queues, you had just have to measure how long each job took and then try to schedule it so that it didn't overlap. But now you can actually add them to a queue and you make sure they happen in a sequence. Okay, so. That was the that was the intro. Let me move into a demo. I just need to move the zoom controls a bit. Okay, so for the demo, I thought I would start with um, looking at some of these internal exchanges. So I've opened here a, a tracker program. So I'll start with showing an internal with the, the tracker to aggregate use case. So let's say I have this uh, tracker program here. I've opened Capture with a household contact investigation program. Uh, it's quite a simple program where we have uh, some screening, a screening event, uh, preventive treatment uh, events, and then one outcome. And for the outcome, you might have uh, that the preventive treatment was completed, stopped, person died, lost a follow-up. So it's it's a, a very simple program. And this data, I want to move into this quarterly uh, data set on uh, TPT outcomes. So I have this, again, quite simple, three data elements with just uh, two age groups. So I'll now show how this data exchange can be set up to populate this quarterly uh, reporting form from uh, the tracker program. Let me just check one thing. I thought I had wiped this uh, data well. Yeah. So I've cleaned out the database. So there is no data for this. So we can actually verify if it works. OK. So. Before going into the configuration, let's just open the data exchange app. Um, so as I said, this is an app that is available in the app hub. Uh, you need to use the latest version if you want to do the, the configuration in the app. Um, I already installed it. So let's open it here. So when you open this app, um, you get this empty box, and then you have at the top uh, drop down where you select the data exchange you want to look at. So, in this case, I have this household contact uh, preventive treatment outcomes. If you just select it, if you don't do anything, it will load the, the preview of the data, which is convenient, but can be a problem if you have a huge uh, data exchange job with lots of data and org units. And you see here now, it gives me a preview of this um, data. So the data here are program indicators. So this is coming directly from the, uh, the tracker program. 
So it will list a table with the periods and the data items for each org unit. Um, so if I want to just submit this data now, save it into the um, aggregate data set, I can do that manually by just clicking uh, Submit. It will verify that you want to submit the data for all these org units and periods. Hopefully it works. Yeah, 47 imported. 25 ignored. So I'm guessing there, yeah, there is something wrong with one of the, the mappings here. Typity started offset. But at least I got uh, the data for 47 of them. So let's see if it actually worked for those. So I go back into the data set. And yeah, this one, uh, I missed something in the config, it seems. So here we now have data. Uh, so this data has now been uh, populated from the program indicators we have defined. And you see this, when you do this, um, I think the stored by is this, for some reason, this box shows no region. I don't know why, but it, it's the stored by gets set to aggregated and uh, the data value will have aggregated as a comment. I think this part is actually being changed now in the latest versions to be the user who is triggering the job. Okay, so now I've sort of proved that it almost works, except for that one data element. So let's look at how it's configured. Uh, so I'll just go into maintenance. And we can look at the, um, the source first. So I have the program indicators here. Um, These are the program indicators for my household um, program. Uh, let's just pick one. So let's say we take the completed outcomes. Uh, TPT completed zero to four years. So it has the, it counts the number of enrollments. The filter is under one and completed. And then there is some limit to how far into the future you want to look for outcomes. Uh, so that's the program indicator. Uh, and then let's also look at the, what our target is. So if you look at completed, I'll just open another. Uh, I hope you can see the various tabs I'm opening here. I'll try to share the whole browser. So there is our data element, TPT outcomes completed. So what we want to do is to move data from this program indicator into this data element with the under five uh, and above five category option combinations. So what do we need to make this work? Well, we need to have some way for DHS2 to know that these two belong together. You could think that you would just use the code of the program indicator and the code of the data element. Uh, and in theory, you can do that in some cases. Uh, but the problem is that because of the disaggregations, we need to have two program indicators uh, to populate the completed data element because there are two age groups. And we can't have two program indicators with the same code. Uh, so if you see here, this program indicator has one code, which is um, identifies that it as the TPT completed, but then it has the last part here, which is the age group. The data element is for both age groups. So that code only has the, the first part. So we can't use the code here to map between the program indicator and the data element. The other option is of course the UID, but the UIDs are unique. So the program indicator and the data element can never have the same UID. So what we need to do 
is to make our own attribute to have this mapping between the program indicator and the data node. So in this database, uh, we have, let me just show that as well. We set up a custom attribute specifically for doing this mapping between program indicators and data nodes. Uh, so it's just a text element that we apply to program indicators because we want to have this available as a field in program indicators to store the link to the data elements. So if you scroll down here on the program indicator, you actually see that we have this custom attribute here <clears throat> called data element for aggregate data export. And this code matches our data element code. So this is how we configure the link between the program indicator and the data element. But in this case, we also have the category option combinations. And those two fields here, category option combination for aggregate data export, attribute option combination for aggregate data export, are actually properties that are built into the program indicator. So for those, you don't need the, um, the custom attribute. You can just use the fields that are here. <clears throat> but of course, you need to put in the, um, the correct value. <clears throat> for both of these, it's sort of up to you to decide whether you want to use UIDs or codes. So in all the um, toolkits and metadata packages, we've chosen to use codes. Um, but you could also use. UIDs instead, if you prefer that. You just need to change the ID scheme when you're importing, which I'll come back to. So category option combination for data export as this code. Let's just double check. Uh, I'll cheat a bit to find the category option combination a bit quicker. It's not always so easy to find. Um, I can get the... UID from the data set and then here it is, zero to four years. And it has the code TB underscore zero zero seven four Y. So this program indicator has a link to the data element, a link to the category option. Uh, so the mapping is there. What we need to do then is to make sure that uh, the right properties are used when the data travels from the source to the target. <clears throat> so let's just open this um, configuration to see how that's done. If I click on configuration here, you will only see this if you have the um, data exchange authority in your user role. This is our um, request. So if I click edit here, you see this is the basic information, the name of the exchange, whether it's external or internal. We have the requests, which is the requests for data. You could have many requests in one exchange um, if you want to break up um and preview some data at the time i'll uh, i can show you how that works later if we have time if i click on the request again the request has a name and then it has this data items which you will recognize from the data visualizer where you can choose all the available uh, data items to include in the re exchange so indicators data elements data sets event data items program indicators so this is where we select that we want to include this TPT completed uh, program indicator. And the periods we want to move the data for, last four quarters. The org units, in this case, it's everything at level four. And then the important part is here under advanced options. Because here we need to make sure that when we're exporting the program indicator data, the identifier of that data needs to be the value that is in this data element for aggregate data export. If this one is set as ID, it will make a data value set 
where the data element ID is the ID of the program indicator, but that can never be imported because you can't import data to a program indicator. So the way we make sure that this value is used in the data value set is by specifying that we want to use this data element for aggregate data export. This output data element ID scheme only applies to any data elements you have um, selected here. So it's not relevant in this uh, job at all because we only have program indicators, but it can be a bit confusing. So just keep in mind that this only applies to data elements in the request. I spent a couple of hours yesterday figuring that out. Uh, and then the last one is the org unit ID scheme. Um, in this case, since it's in an internal exchange, I think it most makes most sense to just leave it at ID, but I mean, all of this should work since it's the same org units we're moving data uh, from and to. So this is the critical part on the request side. When we're doing tracker to aggregate, we need to make sure that our attribute is used as the ID. But we also need to look at the advanced options here for the overall exchange, because this is the ID for the um, target. And even though this target is the same in this case with the internal, we need to specify what ID scheme to use when importing the data value set. In this case, we use the code of the program of the data element uh, as the value we put for our custom attribute. So the date input data element ID scheme needs to be code. Same with the category option. We use the code of the category option. So that needs to be code. We now change the org unit to be ID. So that should be ID. Uh, and then this general ID scheme is not really relevant here um, in this case. We can just leave it at ID, which is the default. So you need to set this ID schemes both for the request and you need to set them on the target. Let me just go back to see if it still works. To see if what I said makes sense. Of course, now the data is already there, but yeah. So still the same one doesn't work, but the others are still uh, matching. Otherwise there will be more conflicts. Uh, okay, so uh, Shurajit or John, I don't know how much time you want to take. I was thinking I could set up one internal exchange from scratch, but maybe since I've already spent uh, 45 minutes, I should just move to uh, doing one example of setting up uh, external exchange between two instances. I don't know. Yeah, just go for the external exchange, man. External? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So uh, let's find a, a data set where we can show the external. So in this case, I, I just thought I would, this is a copy of our HMI's demo database uh, that we have online. So I thought I'll just push some data to that instance uh, as an example. To keep it simple, I will just take one data set and data element without any disaggregations. So let me just put it in, let's say 500. 500 for NC4 and 8, just to see if it makes it across. Uh, so this is in my local instance. Uh, of course, now to make this be included, I need to just quickly run analytics for one year. Uh, while that runs, I will open our Target. Just to prove that I haven't cheated. It's 
So we see here now for NC4, NC8, there is no data. So our goal is to move the 500 values I added in my local instance into this um, data set in our demo server. In this case, the data sets are the same, the organits are the same. These are basically just copies uh, of the two databases. So I don't need to worry about the, the mapping here of the identifiers. I can just use IDs for everything. So this should, in theory, be quite simple. So I'll go to configurations. I'll make a new exchange configuration. I'll call it ANC. And in this case, it's an external exchange. So here, I actually need to specify the target URL. So it's demos HMIS. Um, then you need to put in the either username and password or personal access token. And in these cases, you should always use the personal access token for storing this. That's the, the best practice uh, in this case. Um, let's go to the demo account and make a personal access token. Oh, I'll start by changing the language. So you go into, typically you would set up a dedicated account for these data exchanges with just the minimum authorities needed to save the data. Then log into this account and in the menu here for the user profile, you have personal access tokens and you click generate new token. In this case, we need the server script uh, token. You can choose the expiry. In this case, I only need it for a week to show this. You can have this whitelist so that it only allows data from certain IPs, but it's not required. Uh, and then you have this allowed HTTP methods. And for the data exchange, you need the post to push the data. I think it also uses get. I need to double check. But you need to say that this token should have access to get and post to the API. Uh, and then here it will list the authorities that this token actually has, because in this case, I'm using the demo account and not the minimal account as you should if you're doing this in a production environment. So you click generate new token. And as it says here, you'll only be shown this token once. So you need to actually take it right away. Uh, so you will not be able to go back and find that token again. So now we have our target set up with the URL and the token. Then we need to add a request for the specific um, data. In this case, I'll just call it NC4 and 8. I'm looking for data elements. guessing in the RMNCH group. So I want these two data elements. Let's do the last uh, three months, for example. And I think it should be enough to do this uh, province at the facility level. In this case, like I said, since the, these are two identical databases with the same metadata, I'll just use IDs for everything. We're not mapping from program indicator to data element, so we don't need to worry about the custom attributes, etc. in this case. So I'll save the request. I'll just check here on the target. Also uses IDE for everything. So that's fine. I'll save. Exit configuration mode. And then just cross fingers. I see here now the preview. We have our two 500 values. Try to submit. Imported to updated 99. Let's go back to so now I'm on the demo server again, not my local. And we have our values. 
And in this case, you see again that they come from the aggregate data exchange service because they have this aggregated uh, stored by and uh, comment. So that's it. So when the metadata is synced between instances, it's actually very easy to set up. Um, last thing I'll show quickly is the scheduling of this. Uh, so if you want these jobs to run every night, for example, you set up a new new job. So let's call this ANC data push to demo exchange aggregate data. And I can say every day at 3 a.m. It should run the ANC demo. And now every night, my local instance will push the latest ANC A4 and A data to the demo instance. Um, since this is pulling from analytics, as I said, uh, if you're setting up this uh, properly, you should ideally use a queue. Uh, that includes both the analytics and data exchange. So I can then say, okay, I, I want to first run analytics. Then I want to run the NC data push. So with this queue now, it will run first analytics, then the data push in sequence. And this scheduling of the queue will overwrite the scheduling of each job. So when I save this, these two jobs that was there before will uh, be gone from the list of scheduled jobs. They will not run on their own anymore. They will only run as part of this, uh, this queue. So if you're doing this for tracker to aggregate, you should first run tracker analytics then run the data exchange, then aggregate analytics as one queue here. Um, this queue functionality, I think, was introduced in um, version 40. Uh, so you need version 40, I think, and this updated scheduler app. Uh, otherwise, you don't see the queue. I think in... I need to check this. It's possible that it's in 39, but just that it didn't originally have the support in the scheduler app. So you had to use the API. Okay. That was uh, what I wanted to demo. Just ending up with a few links here. So I guess we can uh, you can have access to the slides with these uh, links. So a link to the data exchange app, uh, documentation on this backend service to the app, and then our general tracker to aggregate uh, documentation. Both these two last ones have not been updated um, with the latest uh, configuration um, functionality. OK, uh, then uh, I don't know if there are questions. At least from my side, I'm uh, I've gone through what I wanted.